Another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Bob Bryan. Hello there. I ought to start this yarn. There was a man in our town, and he was wondrous wise. You remember that old nursery rhyme? But somehow it doesn't sound like the man, though he was wise in a strange, almost supernatural mechanical way. You'll find old timers who will tell you that Bob Bryan was a mechanical genius. That if he had been equipped with tools in a laboratory of Edison, he would have been revolutionary in the physical world. You may hear that Bob Bryan never touched a safe he couldn't open and never had to, a fix-it job that he couldn't do. Well, those are a little bit extravagant as descriptions of our friend Bob. But there is enough truth in them to account for a man who became a legend in his own time. Bob Bryan was born in Mound City, Kansas back in 1872. He was a lad in his teens when he finally moved west to Olympia where his father taught school and he was a young man just out of the Eastern Electrical School when his family moved to Aberdeen. His father became first high school principal, then superintendent of Aberdeen schools. And Bob, why, he became one of the town's best known citizens, one of the first men of the harbor as individuals go, and a character that might have stepped out of the pages of an O. Henry's novel. We're going to talk about Bob in just a minute, but before we start, let's have a few words from Dick Crombie and our sponsors. When Grays Harbor cities were little sawdust towns and the current that flowed through the wires and made lights burn was still considered nothing less than a miracle, Bob Bryan came to Aberdeen. Bob was young, but he had already acquired a substantial knowledge of the physical laws. Two years as an, at the Eastern Electrical School had equipped him for the job that he took as assistant engineer in the Aberdeen's Little Electric Light Plant. In that capacity, Bob helped Joe Ness keep the steam-powered turbine in operation, and his additional job was to trim the carbons in the street lamps. If you were a real old-timer, you may remember Bob hitching his lanyard to a ring on one of those old arc lights and lowering it down to the street so that it can be trimmed and recarboned. In those days, there were no mended fix-it shops. If the wheel came off a baby carriage or the handle off in your umbrella, either the man of the house tinkered with the equipment and fixed it, or it remained unfixed and you bought a new one. But this was a small town, and when Bob Bryan fixed a mechanical gadget for one of the natives and put a spoke in a bicycle for another, the word got around. In the back room of the electrical plant, Bob began to fix things. And to the back room of that little public utility, line of town folk with things to be fixed made their way. Sometimes it was a clock that they knew only Bob could repair. Sometimes it was a wheelbarrow. Then there were kitchen utensils and wash chains, platform type rocking chairs and door latches. And then one day, someone brought in a small safe to the back room, and Bob proved that he had the capacity that later gained him the greatest fame, the touch of fingers that could open the most complex safe. Well, before long, Bob was working as much nights over at, at his fix-it work as he worked in the day at the electrical shop. And finally, he figured out on a cash-in-hand basis that there was more to be the fixing thing for people in Grace Harbor than there was in trimming street lamps and ceiling oiling the generators. So he quit the electrical job and set up a bicycle shop. That's what he called it. Though fixing bicycles was only a small part of his work, 
He picked a location along East Heron Street and opened for business. From the start, business was good. All the town folks who had beat a path to Bob's shop in the back room of the power plant now came to the cycle shop, and he went right on fixing and got paid for it. Now, like most people with a touch of true genius, Bob was a little bit temperamental. No one successfully explained that ingredient of character that makes genius like that. Perhaps it's just an impatience with people who are a little slower to grasp things. Anyhow, Bob had it, and it showed up every so often. He'd get crotchety and fidgety and then had to take a vacation. So he'd close the place, put the key in his pocket, and go hunting or fishing or just go. The wanderlust would come over him, and he'd be off on a trip that might last a month or two. Once on a junket back eastward to revisit the haunts of his electrical school days, he settled down in Rockford, Illinois and became a manager of the first electrical street railway. But after he had gotten well immersed in the business of making the line run, he threw it up and came back to his fixing business in Aberdeen and was contented again for a while. One time his ramblings took him down into Mexico where a former harbor man, B.J. Johnson, was putting in a sugar refinery in Aguila. Bob installed the machinery and stayed two seasons. It was a long, hard period for the cyclists of the town who had to make the most of their own repairs. And that was serious, too, because bicycles were an essential means of transportation in those long-ago days. So Aberdeen's residents on wheels were greatly relieved when Bob showed up again and opened the door of the shop and started business as usual. Well, as we said, fixing bicycles was a bulk of his work, but Bob had shown the capacity for fixing that required more finesse. He proved that he could repair any lock, make a key for the most complicated, and he could open any safe yet made, given time and tools. So Bob's sort of worked out of the cycle business and became a locksmith and incidentally a gunsmith too. Now the stories that have been told about Bob's ability to crack a safe are many. There is one that involved Moose Goldsmith, the manager of the old Empire Theater. Above the theater, Moose ran a game of chance which provided the operator much more of a solid income than did his Victorian performances on the stage or the flickering screen of the theater below. Finally, he decided that a safe was necessary to protect his increasing fortune, and he shopped for Bob Bryan. Well, Bob had a safe, but he didn't want to sell it to the manager of the Empire Theater. Some of their previous business dealings had prejudiced Bob against him, but Mo Mose wanted it, and at his own price. Will you take it as is, Bob asked? Sure, just as it is, Goldsmith assured him. All right, Bob told him, take it along at your price. And Mose showed up an hour later with a wheelbarrow and hauled the safe away. Now driving a hard bargain with Bob Bryan was something that required more than a bargaining instinct. It also required a sharper mind than the Empire Theater manager possessed. And when he got the safe up to his parlor of chance, he found that he couldn't open it. He hurried back to Bob's shop. I can't open it, he said. Where's the combination? Haven't got the combination, Bob told him. I bought it just as it is, and you bought it for me just as it is. I've never tried to open it, but I'll open it for $50. Well, Goldsmith had bought the safe for less than that, and he couldn't see paying $50 to get it open, so he wrote it off as a bad deal, and the safe remained in the corner of his office, locked and useless. But one morning, Goldsmith heard a rumor. He was having breakfast down the street when someone casually mentioned that they heard that Bob Ryan was bemoaning that he sold a small safe unopened that he had later learned was filled with valuables. Bob doesn't really know what's in that safe, the informant said, but it seems there's something of considerable value. He said he sold it without knowing it, and now it belongs to someone else. Goldsmith asked a few questions, very pointed questions, and was satisfied in his own mind that the safe 
that sat in the corner of his parlor was the same one that Bob had parted with before investigating. That afternoon he showed up at Bob's. Would Bob still open the safe for $50? Well, Bob wasn't sure, but after some urging, he agreed to do the job. They, repri they retired to the loft of the Empire Theater where Bob went to work for an hour. And before the locksmith would permit the owner to have the combination, he insisted on his money. He collected, and the Empire manager, keen-eyed with anticipation, dug into the safe for valuables. You guessed it. The valuables turned out to be a lot of stock and bonds in defunct, fire, in defunct firms, a couple of voided life insurance policies, and a pair of superior gold earrings. Then there was the affair with W.J. Patterson. Billy, as the town knew him, had a large office safe that had closed and would not open. He summoned Bob. Now Bob, with the true touch of a master craftsman, was very cons was a very conservative fellow. He made no spectac spectacle of his abilities, and that is, he tried not to. He worked with the safe for the morning and finally decided that he needed some special tools. He had another idea too. He felt the tumblers in the lock had gotten stuck. Perhaps he tipped the safe and tapped the lock. But Billy Patterson was no one to trifle with. When Bob had not produced results after a few short hours of work, Bill ordered an expert so called down from Seattle. And at the command of Billy Patterson, the expert came flying. Well, the Seattle locksmith tinkered for another day, and the safe was no closer to being open than before. Finally, the Seattle man threw down his tools and announced that he would have to take the safe from Gray's Harbor Iron and Machine Works to burn out the opening with a torch. Jim Fuller, Patterson's right-hand man, made the necessary arrangements to have the strong box carted to the operating room. And as the dray backed up to the building and the safe was slung into the boom of the crane, Bob Bryan appeared and advocated his method of tilting the safe and tapping the lock. Jim Fuller agreed to give Bob a chance, and Bob tilted, tapped, and opened the safe, much to the consternation of Billy Patterson and the expert from Seattle, and a crowd that assembled to watch the old master at work. And then there was the story of the safe that Bob opened for a rather affluent resident of our town, who was advised when Bob had finished his work of picking the lock, that it would take $20 to pay Bob's for 15 minutes of work. The man exploded at the thought of such a fee. So Bob slammed the door of the safe, spun the combination, and went back to his shop. After a week of glaring at the safe, the owner called Bob back and offered to pay him $20. But it would be 40 now, Bob said. 20 for each trip. This time the owner of the safe was smart. He paid the $40. There were countless of stories of Bob Bryan that we've got some more of here, but at this particular spot, we want to make room for Dick Crombie and a word from our sponsor. Almost every old timer had a dealing with Bob Bryan at one time or another. Ed Finch took advantage of Bob's genius on one occasion to have him make a number of keys for some safety deposit box. Midway in the work, after Bob had made about half the keys, Finch changed his mind and refused to pay for the work done. And that, as we have noted, was something that Bob Bryan didn't forget. The day for revenge came when Finch stood before the elevator in his five-story building, tongue lashed and hoist because it was not working. He called Bob Bryan. Bob surveyed the job and quoted the figure for the work and sent the important Aberdonian up in a shower of sparks. But after Finch had figured Bob's exorbitant fee against what it would cost to bring a man down from Seattle, he paid it. Bob's crowing revenge came when he took the check. This, he said, also pays for the keys that you forgot to pay for. There was almost nothing that Bob Bryan hadn't tried his hand at. He was an excellent cook and canned much of the wild game that he brought back from his hunting trips. 
He was an outdoor enthusiast who knew the trails and rivers of the Olympic Peninsula like maps. He built a clock that mystified the town. Its face was glass, it had no works, and the two hands turned in the best timekeeping fashion without apparent power. The nearest that he would ever come to revealing his secret was that it worked by a magnet. Now some of you who did not know Bob Bryan would no doubt ask, how does it happen that a man with such genius stay in this small town? And why didn't he invent and patent things to make a lot of money? You had to know Bob to have the answer. He liked it his way. He wanted to stay where his friends were. Secondly, he had patented a few of his inventions and each saw some big concern circumvent his patent and walk off with his idea. And he did make money, wooden money. For when the city of Aberdeen marked its 50th anniversary, the committees for the affair engaged Bob to met wooden quarters with the likeness of Sam Ben. They are collector's items today, as are the drawings, the gadgets, and the stories of the Grace Harbor's most colorful figure, the Irishman, whose agile brain and sensitive fingers won him a place in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank <music> you.